All right, we're back with the Greg and Greg Show and hey. Joao Assis. That's right. Are we li- we're officially live. I yeah, we're going. to this mic. Um, so before we, we just wrapped up our Guns and Geese weekend, but before we go into any of that stuff, we had a story we needed to talk about. So I want to hear about it, Joao. Which one? The guy pulling your backpack. Oh, man. That happened a couple weeks ago. I was in Dominican Republic. And I had a good good time there over there. I was teaching this camp uh, with some some other badasses, and everything was good. Everything was good. I was coming home. I was like excited to be back. And as soon as I entered my my last my last uh, flight to 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 Los Angeles, uh, the flight crew lady asked me to 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 leave my carry on on the very first uh, overhead storage. Overhead storage. Yeah. And so I did, and then I, my my seat was a way on the back, and there is a lot of people there. You know, everything was was packed up, so everything goes right. I use my mask the whole flight, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, nobody bothered me. But at the very end, when I when I when I was leaving the airplane, I for, I totally forgot about my carry on, and then um, that was when I, I I literally give like two three steps away from from outside the the door. Right, and it, that clicks. Uh, I remember. Oh shit, my 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 bag. Right, so I turn back, and as I am like what an inch away from from reaching my bag, which is on the very very first spot, uh, this flight crew attendant, which was a you know a pain ass, <laughs> he he caught me by by the handle on my backpack. Were you about to call him a faggot? Basically, yeah. <laughs> can I? Can I? Yeah, you can say whatever you want All on right, our show. Okay, good. So the faggot got, got me from from my from my the, the handle on my backpack, right? And bro, that brought me brought like fire inside me like in half a second, right? And when I turned back, so I told, he grabbed you and physically pulled you back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and saying you cannot come back to the airplane. I'm like, dude. Don't fucking ever touch me again or being disrespectful to that disrespectful to that level. You know what I mean, bro? You don't even fucking you have Especially no idea. fucking grabbing you. It's like, hey sir, you can't yeah, go back. Thing, what know, do you need? Yeah, okay, exactly. That's you know, like and I was being polite the whole time. I would just turn back and go to reach my bag and this dude just pick you Well know, and you, you stepped one foot off the airplane. Basically. Basically. It was not more than that. I was like literally what well, I remember and turned back and this dude picked me, you know, by my by my back. Like if I was a kid, right, dude? And that fires me up to the point where I'm like, you know, You don't like, put your hands on I another man. the blood in my eyes. <laughs> and then I was like, dude, you dev- don't fucking ever disrespect anyone to this level. You just did, you know, like. And he was like, oh, but you cannot come back to the airplane. I'm like, dude, I barely step off the plane, you know? And I, by this time, like a second later, this dude just reached me the bag, right? And then that was it, <laughs> basically, <laughs> right? And this guy like, I can call the cops on you. I'm like, dude, you, you, by the time the cops are here, you'll be dead, motherfucker, right? So don't fucking mess with people. Don't disrespect people just because you are in a, on the position you are, which is nothing more than just a job, right? Well, and, and think about that. He'll put his hands on you. And then when you get upset, He'll I'll, play call the, I'll call the cops yeah. on you. Yeah. Exactly. You know? There yeah. are certain things when you become an adult that if you're going to do something, you better understand the repercussions could lead to physical violence, like yelling at people with a bullhorn. <laughs> <laughs> or putting their hands on a seven-time world or, champion. Or exactly. putting, putting your hands and fucking grab exactly. yeah, because, grabbing anyone like, because you grab me, we're going to fight. Mostly because I wouldn't do that kind of stuff. You know, knowing who I am, but being the, 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 uh, the level of respect I, I, I give to, to anyone, right? And I, I expect that just back, right? I think respect's a two-way lane. So that was fucked up, you know? And of course, it didn't happen nothing, but for, for, for two minutes... Outside the airport, I was just expecting, and waiting for the flight crew to come off. <laughs> to that motherfucker come out, you know, and I would literally kick his ass, you know, like literally, yeah, you know, bury my 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 shoe. How was the Dominican Republic? Say so what? How was it there, bro? Amazing place. Amazing. I've never place. been. I know nothing about it's it. It's one of those places that we don't know, right? They're now on the mainstream. It's a re- hidden gem. 
in in the in the in the Caribbean. Yeah, it's right? beautiful. I spent some and, time there, bro. And I hope it stays like that, right? Because nowadays, like Mexico, all the uh, Cancun area, right? Playa del Carmen, uh, Tulum. You see, everybody's going there, right? So it's kind of, you know, there's nothing nothing new, nothing special when when it became when it become mainstream, right? And I'm the type of person I, I really like to go to this place where nobody knows these hidden gems, this hidden paradise. And after living there, I was like, man, I really want to come back. I want to bring my friends there, right? I want to have a good time there again. And um, when I first got there, I noticed that there was a lot of kite surf, wind surf, those sports, right? Which I'm not really into. But I, I made I end up making some some uh, some pro, some lessons. Yeah, I, I saw a video of you with the, with the with the kite. Fun. Something really cool, really fun to do. You know. Do you know if it's good diving there? I don't know about the diving there, man. But the sur- they've got really good surfing as well. They got good surf there. Oh, definitely, bro. Definitely. Um, it's crazy going across I've, I've the border tried from surfing. Haiti to DR. I tried surfing it's just one up time. On the board, you know? <laughs> Nothing more than that. Hey, me and me and Tony Gonzalez. Oh, shout yeah. out Tony, Tony Gonzalez. Tony's a good dude. dude. Him and I tried surfing in Long Beach, and we paddled offshore like. We ended up paddling offshore like a hundred meters, oh, and then we just sat on our boards and talked about jujitsu for two hours, <laughs> exactly. and then we paddled but that, in. <laughs> but that was probably one of the nicest things about surfing, bro. It's 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 being there, you know, yeah. within the nature, out there with your thoughts, exactly, you know, like resetting yourself and 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 being there and connecting to to the world, right, with the planet, you know, it's like pure, hundred percent pure nature. It's yeah. it's really cool, and the best thing is probably very much probably nobody gonna bother you, right? Except a great white, basically, you know. But but it's crazy because I th- I think great whites whites are probably better than ninety nine percent of the people. people. Right? <laughs> Dude, here's a weird thing about the ocean: if I'm under the surface, no issues at all. Like I have no fear when I'm scuba diving. Yeah. But when I'm on a surfboard and my legs are dangling You're in, chum. you have no idea. I, here's the thing: if a shark's gonna fucking bite you, there's nothing you can do to stop it. But just having that peace of mind of having awareness of your surroundings gives you that comfort. When you're when you're on scuba, right? You're part of the ecosystem. <laughs> right? Yeah. When you're floating on the surface, you're chum. You're like you're like a, a cork popping on the surface, looking all yummy for shit underneath you. And you always <laughs> look like a suit, right? Yeah, yeah, dude. yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I, I think I told you the story before, but I went to the Great Barrier Reef for my honeymoon yeah. with Jenny. And we dived out there for like three or four days straight. And we went on a boat that took us out. And we were on that boat the whole time. It had like a, a nice fucking suite that we got for our honeymoon. And it was only day diving. And we hear this loud knock on my door at two in the morning. I'm like, what the fuck is this? And we open the door. It's one of the crew guys that I'd kind of become homies with over the course of the last couple of days. And he goes, hey, man, we're doing a crew only night dive. But since you and your wife are cool, we want to invite you. We're not inviting any of the other customers, though. That's right. And so I told, yeah, I was like, Jenny, we got to go. That's that's yeah. a cool invite, right? Zero illumination. It was like one of those nights where you couldn't even see your hand in front wow, of your face. Speech dark kind of shit. And they give you a light that you're holding in your hand. And wherever you shine it, you have a, a beam, like maybe two or three feet wide that you can see. And outside of that, pitch fucking black. Fuck yeah. So me and Jenny hold hands for the entire dive so I can keep track of her. And we do the whole dive, and the entire time, I'm and, like... And, and who's more scary? <laughs> well, well, here, dude, here's, here's the funny thing. The entire dive, I'm like, fuck this, dude. <laughs> and then the fucking guy guiding the dive... That's an answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the guy get, do, uh, guiding the dive gives the hand and arm signal to go to the surface, so we inflate our BCDs, and we float to the top. I'm looking around, like, what the fuck, dude? We're like 400 meters away from the boat. So he's like, we'll just back kick back to the boat. So now... We're back You're kicking dangling on the surface. On the surface. In the dark. In pitch black, yeah. dude. And I was just like, fuck, dude. Like, dangerous situations freak me out when you have zero element of control. Yeah. Even know. like in combat, whatever. You have a say in what happens. I have no say in what happens. And I get back on the boat. We de kit. We go to our fucking room. And I told Jenny, I was like, I don't know if you enjoyed yourself or not, but just so you know where I'm at, that's my last fucking night dive. And she goes, like, lets out a sigh of relief. She goes, oh, thank God. Thank God you just said that. I fucking hated that. She goes, 
But if you were cool with it, I wasn't going to say anything because, like, it's our honeymoon. I want to, if, if that's your thing, like, I want you to enjoy yourself while you're down here. <laughs> and I'm like, that's a good woman, dude. dude she's <laughs> she's willing to go back out there <laughs> if I liked it. Just for you, right? And I'm like, nope, never again, dude. You're but, on the surface floating. You're just cruising down the street waiting to catch an IED. Yeah, dude. You're <laughs> under the surface on scuba. You're on patrol with your fucking team ready to get, yeah, defend yeah. A, you know, a counter ambush or defend, you know, yourself in a gunfight. But dude, like all my diving has been in Seattle where you're wearing a seven oh, inch fuck thick, that, dude. seven yeah. mil, not seven inch, seven mil wetsuit. I'm suit. a pleasure diver, dude. And so this is the first time I'm just fucking diving in board shorts. It was so fucking yeah, rad, dude. Yeah, I haven't I haven't dived many many times. But the the, the the spots I have done was was really good. I have I have done uh, out of the coast of California in uh, Catalina. Yeah, Island. Catalina. It's man. amazing, bro. It's amazing. The seaweed it's, beds and shit it's out like there. You're flying yeah. on this this alien world, it's right? Crazy. And it's it's amazing. I have done also in Florianopolis, uh, Santa Catarina in Brazil. It's a uh, it's an island. It's uh, the Brazilian Hawaii. It's a Bro, amazing, amazing place, like a surf city. Yeah. You know, like one of the best spots in the world too. The uh the Sunga Life guys, shout out Sunga Life. I'm wearing their I'm wearing their shark shorts right now. They do a uh thing called Blue Force where it's conservation. It's somewhere off the coast of Florida. And it's a trip they do every year. And they invited me down for the next one. Okay. So I better get dialed in on diving. You guys should fucking come down, dude. All right, it's no, the Sunga Life know, guys no, totally and uh, Rudy Reyes that run that. And uh, do you, Rudy, Rudy. Do I don't know if you guys listened to the episode I did with Paul DeGelder. Yes, I did. The Australian guy yeah, that got yep. his arm and his leg bit off. Wow. Yeah, cool. he, got, he got invited too. He's gonna go down. That dude's fucking rad. Fuck, that was, that's I'm gonna what, stay right next to him because the chance of him actually getting attacked again is <laughs> yeah, probably super exponentially unlikely. lower. So I'm gonna stay right next to him. The rest of you guys, are, <laughs> hey, it's like who hey. here's been in a helicopter crash? <laughs> All right, cool. We're good. I, I'm getting on. <laughs> I'm getting on that bird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then you also got the guys. That have been in like five helicopter crashes, and they're just shit. And I've been in zero. You know what I mean? Like, they say like if you get struck by lightning, it's more likely you get struck by lightning again. Have you ever heard that, bro? Like couple couple a month ago, I have been. I was in Brazil. You're playing, and I I was as I was uh, landing on my city down down Mm -hmm. south, bro. The 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 airplane got hit by a lightning in the middle of a storm, and that was the one of the most scariest things of my life, bro. I I thought. Literally, that we are going down like on the. Didn't you say it sounded like a bomb went off? Or was like, wasn't it loud or just a big flash or what? Man, actually, the 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 lightning hit the the wing, and I was looking at the wing, so I knew it was. Oh fuck! I, I honestly, I thought the 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 one of the turbines explode because I didn't see the lightning. I just saw the explosion, the fire, you know, the sparkles, and I was like fuck you know like dude that's it that's it you know like that's the end you know but the only my only thought was like i just the only thing i could see was my daughter's face and my thought was like don't fucking scream die like a fucking man you know? that, was, that was it i'm like see your daughter see my daughter you know look like the only thing i want to do it but my last second of leaving in this world was like seeing her face and the thought of like bro just be a badass and die quiet you know don't scream <laughs> so dude what do you guys think of this because i was on a flight from uh, philadelphia to seattle one time and we were we were over idaho so we were almost done and I hear an explosion that sound like an IED went off. And the fucking pilot gets on the intercom. He goes, we just had an engine explode, and we're going in for an emergency landing. Fuck. And I was with one of my Ranger buddies, Dave, and we're sitting right next to each other. And we're like, bro, if this thing starts to fucking crash and we know we're going to crash, what makes more sense, to bail out of the aircraft or ride it in? Because people don't live when you ride in 747s. No, no, no. You do hear about skydivers burning in and living. Yeah, but with a rig. Yeah, no, no. I'm not saying that either <laughs> choice is uh, good, but do you want to... They just, burn in because they have a double malfunction, but they still have some They have a cigarette of, roll kind of... They have some semblance yeah. of canopy over them. <laughs> but I was like, dude, okay, it's fire explosion or impact. What do we want to take? And we both said... Let's let's try the impact option. No, bro. You know? I, I tell you, one of the things that that I I I thought by when I saw the explosion and the, the airplane went like you know that one two seconds, 
I was like, bro, I, I, I had a pillow with me, so I hugged my pillow, and I felt like, dude, I'm going to hug this shit so hard. I'm going to become a fucking rock, and the shit going to explode all over me, and I will survive. <laughs> I, didn't think, I, I didn't think like, bro, oh, you would die, be the guy. <laughs> you would be the lone I would, survivor, I would, dude. bro, because I'm, on my mind, it was like that positivity of like, dude, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. And I'm like, rocks, you know, like I won't break, I won't break, you know. And then the, 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 and like, don't scream, my daughter's in my in my eyes, you know. And then clearly, here I am. Right? <laughs> so you survived, you survived impact. Holding the pillow worked, huh? No, it didn't have impact, you know. <laughs> Nothing happened. We just landed. Yeah, yeah. it just landed. <laughs> did they we landed another, it? We landed another city. So actually, they did make an emergency landing then? No, huh? no, no. We went to another city, another state. Took another hour to to land because uh, of the lightning strike. They diverted. Yeah, no, okay. Not just because of the lightning strike, but the, it was a really bad storm happening. Uh, the crazy thing: the 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 pilot didn't say one word for the next one hour. That's so fucked up, dude. Exactly. It's bad, bad, bad. So what happened is the next day, that that situation become uh, went to the news, uh -huh. right? Because we have had some 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 air, airplane crashes. You know, and you know when it happens, they 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 put on the news like the the conversation between the pilot and the tower. Oh, so you got and to listen. I listened to that, yeah. And the uh, pilot was freaking out, like, but he kept the 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 you know. Yeah, the sound. Yeah, yeah. He 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 was he he did everything right, but he was scared, like the voice. Yeah, you know, you can hear that later. The 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 whole thing happened, and the whole situation was like, bro. It was crazy. It Dude, was, it was a crazy experience. When we lost an engine, the pilot got on the intercom and he goes. We're making a one-engine emergency landing. He goes, but I don't like calm down because I've I've done one of these in flight school. I'm like, I don't oh, know. That's, if that's that's fucking reassuring. <laughs> it's better than having done, right? So yeah. Calm down. I just watched a YouTube video in the cockpit on how to do it. And this is a good conversation to have because you and I are about to board a flight in two hours. Right. <laughs> and I'm about to go fly an airplane tomorrow. But you know, it's crazy, bro. Like the next flight it took because I have to take another flight like a couple hours after that flight. And when I sat on the next airplane, I felt like, how should I feel, you know? Like, <laughs> should I be freaking out and have this trauma or, or just be a badass and learn with the experience and... Don't don't fear at all because now I have a never I have a new plateau right I have a new standard for fear yeah. right and actually that's how I felt like wow well, I can choose between one another I choose being being experienced you know and yeah. have no fear so then I, the next flight kind of was had some turbulence and I was just fine you know I was just like Pfft. I have the, I have been in worse situations you know so Bro. I think that ha I didn't help me you know yeah you, sometimes you can choose between the trauma or being experienced in things through like bad bad situations right and i chose to be strong to be you know like now it takes way more it takes takes uh, much more than a, a lightning hitting my my plane to to make me you know yeah shake on my like on Bro, my knees the older i get the the more i dislike flying and i don't know what it is because like when i was young i mean i i went to flight school in the army i wanted to fly ch-47s you guys all know how that ended crossfit fucking hemorrhage my retina and i got kicked out of flight school but i didn't give a fuck about turbulence or like flying around in black hawks and crazy conditions and shit like i love that and now i hit a little bit of turbulence and my palms start sweating dude <laughs> like hey i can't help it i'm just being honest dude i hate flying just because i hate the whole industry and the logistical aspect of commercial flights and people and all the stupid shit that's, Bro, going I, that's I, what i'm, I'm doing wor i'm work. working my ass to the point where i'm gonna start flying at some point uh first class only right <laughs> so so that moment i think you're gonna start liking the flights because my only my only concern about flying uh nowadays is uh, space and masks i just yeah. hate the 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 lack of space and the have and the the and have to use masks you know so the, the mask thing thing the industry's turned to shit too because it's like it's the only um business model where the people running the business can treat their customers like shit yeah and get away with it that's because so they bump no you from flights they change the price they change the schedule the date they fucking grab you by your backpack they're assholes to you and they're grumpy the whole process of the way through and they fucking get away with it exactly. and it drives me fucking nuts and it feels like you have nothing you can do about it. sorry right? i'm angry today but make a instagram <laughs> Dude, post or send an email comes you down. eventually it would never be answered so mm -hmm. it's a pain in the ass no, and if you do do anything, if you have any kind of altercation, 
Jail. Jail? jail. Or at a minimum, like Mitch. Straight to jail. Mitch is on uh, some no fly lists because a uh, fucking he said some dumb little stewardess was like he was fucking oh what did he say I think he called Mitch a bitch and anyone that knows Mitch like dude he's seriously one of the most down to earth nice people you've ever met but his switch flips when he Bang. gets disrespected Fuck. and he's also one of the most capable fucking people and he goes listen. I will fucking beat the shit out of you if you fucking talk to me like that again. Just so you're fucking clear of how this interaction is going to go. And so... <laughs> Back to my original thing. Yeah. There are consequences yeah. if you go a certain way. Exactly. And so... Respect is a true lane. Is a, is a true way lane, bro. You give, you receive, and... Of course, but be. they don't have to anymore, right? Exactly. I mean, I've talked about that on the show a lot. There's no consequences in our society anymore for treating people like shit. So people think they can get away treating people like shit. Yep. But fast forward a couple months and he was out at my house and I dropped him off at the airport. And he texts me like 10 minutes later. He's like, can you come back and pick me up? I'm on a no fly list with this airline. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. But uh, I, know, I know a girl, a fine girl, a very good girl. <laughs> <laughs> I have almost been put on that list for not using masks during the flight, right? So, yeah, they basically do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. And I hate, I, I hate, because the airline's the only place that I will wear a mask because... Well, you have to get places. You have to, I have to get places. I have to come down here to be part of Guns and Geese. Another camp. reason why I'm doing what I'm you doing. You know? <laughs> but uh, I got a mask that has a wire bridge that goes across the nose. And you can fucking, like, you bend it. So there's like yeah. this much space, like a couple inches between your nose and where the mask actually makes contact with you. And that's, that's what I hate about this is like nobody cares that if your mask is going to make them sick or not. They just care if you're adhering to what they tell you, exactly. you know? So as long as it's on your face, they can see that it's fucking two inches away from my face, but I haven't had anybody say anything yet. Dude, in the beginning... I simply wore a bandana. I folded a bandana in half into a triangle, and I would put that over when I'd have to fly, right? Two layers. I flew, actually, I think it was when I flew out to you last on Alaska, right? And I'm getting on the plane with my bandana folded in half, two layers, and this fucking dude who's a flight attendant for Alaska goes, um... That's not going to work. You need a regular mask. I said, I've been wearing this on flights every couple of weeks, every month. I've been flying a lot. Well, you need a, I said, I don't have one. This is what I have. This is what I wore. They let me on the bridgeway. They let me on the plane when they checked my ticket. Well, you can't wear it. I was like, well, then give me a mask. Yeah. What, like, what do you want from me? Well, you have to wear one of these paper ones. I was like, I have to wear one of these paper ones? I fucking hate the paper ones. Because the ring, the thing that goes around your ear... Pulls on you bro, gives you a headache. it fucking gives my cauliflower ear, like, cauliflower so much problems. pain, bro. Dude, it's a real thing. It's a real thing, dude. My ears are fucking killing me at the end of it. So I like to wear the bandana, because it all goes around the back of my head. You have to wear this mask. You can't wear that bandana. And then the announcement comes on. Hi, welcome to Alaska Airlines. This is Alaska President so-and-so. Thank you for joining our flight. Please adhere. You must wear any sort of multi-layer face covering while on the plane. I'm like, oh, what's that, motherfucker? Multi-layer face covering? And, bro, they say, it's just so fucking retarded. If you have a little sock that has strings on it that goes around your ears, you're cool. It worked. But they said now if you, if you wear a gator-style mask, you have to wear two gators. Have you heard that on no, the flights? No, I have not heard that. It's fucking ridiculous bullshit. it's the fucking dumbest shit in the world um i wanted to ask you one more thing about the dominican republic is it cheap yes yes that's the best part bro like my whole life i've always been traveling mostly to europe right in brazil and i don't really uh, know uh the the central and south america other than mexico and brazil and after I come back home, I was checking the flight pl uh, price and the Airbnbs around the area. And, bro, it's fucking cheap. It's a good place to go, you know. It's a good place to, to, to it's, a, it's a perfect place to go to the paradise for cheap, right? Anywhere around the, the Caribbean, right? 
like Cuba, Jamaica, um, all the Central America, you know, those countries underneath uh, Mexico. Bro, they are cheap as fuck and they are amazing, you know, like amazing. And eventually, you're going to find these hidden gems around and, bro, they cost way less than going all over to the, to the other side of the, 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 the ocean and going to Europe and all those places, right? Because in the up that you have to move a lot around there and that's what becomes kind of expensive, right? Like changing hotels and all these other time. Yeah. Uh, flights here and there. Even though, uh, you know, Europe's still uh, pretty cheap because you have like cheap flights, like 50 euros, you know, to go from country to country. But my next, my next trips... Right, that I'm gonna put my money on to, to go. It's gonna be around the Caribbean, so I'm gonna I'm gonna discover a lot of things for 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 a fair price. Yeah, pretty cheap. Were they cool, or is the COVID shit going hard down there? Or is uh, it not that hard? Not that hard, but it's still some. You know, the airport you have to use the mask. Yeah, that. but I mean, it's it's getting less and less. You know, like I think it's we are you're at some point you're you're about to to get rid of all this bullshit, you know? Because like, it sounds like Europe is still crazy. Yeah, so that's no, another that's reason. Like, Bro, I'm Europe not going is, back to Europe until Europe all this shit nowadays, blows over. Right? Like, France is the being, is being the most uh, a terrorist attacked country on the world over the last few years, right? Bro? Mm -hmm. So if you think about like security, you know, Europe is not a standard anymore, right? It's not safe in Europe anymore, right? You have all these, uh, these attacks and shit happening over there. You know, like, and we still like, of course, in uh, South America, and you you have all the bullshit that happens there, the bad things, the the like the how they call the um, corruption, corruption, stuff. gangs, yeah. you know, all that the drug thing. But bro, you know, like we we have condition to go on the best areas, which you know they 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 need the tourism to to happen, so they don't fuck around. You know, even the cartels, you know, they, they, they yeah, make money Saudis with the tourism, Mexico, you know, yeah, so sure. so they keep they leave you alone as long as, you know, you don't fuck around and spend your money and have fun, you know. So uh, I think that right now for, for who lives in America, like that side of the world, this side of the world, like Caribbean, Central America, South America is a good good place to go for, for cheap, you know, other than just going over Europe and that, like which, which you, I used to basically focus on that part of the world you know yeah all right then that's we need to get that on the schedule a trip yep, to a trip be, to the dominican republic yep. yeah that's dr is awesome dude so when i was um in haiti working for uh the embassy there we would when we had like a long weekend a few of us from the team would go right across the border we'd drive into dominican republic and it's amazing like so there's like a little like a little DMZ, right? You yep, go yep. out of the Haiti gate, out of Haiti, and you traverse like, I don't know, 50, 100 yards, and then you go through the gate into the Dominican Republic. And it's like, uh, you ever watch Who Framed Robert Rab Roger Rabbit, where it's like you go through the tunnel and it's Toontown and it opens up and it's beautiful and color colorful? Yeah. I have seen it, but I was like, like six. Sounds yeah. like, I don't sound like the Koreas. Oh, well, I have a six year old, so I've watched it recently, <laughs> right? But uh, dude, it's like, you're, you're, it's like the whole, everything changes in an instant. Like the right. color of the sky, the color of the trees, the color of the buildings, everything. Because like, Haiti's the, the third world shit. Bro, you don't, right? Haiti you don't have to go is, far, bro. You don't Haiti have to is go a far. shit hole. Like the, 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 the border in between California and Mexico is It's the same way, like bro. That. Yeah, it's right? the same on way. On one side, you've seen this green fields, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Down, and then, yeah, pfft, the mm -hmm. other side of the, the wall, yeah. you yeah. know, all the favelas and all this bullshit happening. I mean, you know, yeah. that's kind of Different crazy worlds. to think about. Dude, so it's crazy. Like, and here's the thing: human like, beings have created these lines, these arbitrary lines, on fucking pieces of geography. That's crazy. And that's it. Human beings and and government created that because Haiti could be beautiful, dude. The water, other than having trash and pollution in the water, dude, the water is beautiful and clear. Uh -huh. Like the mountains, like the the vegetation. It's the same island. It's the same fucking it's little exactly island. It's, it's and it's one of them is beautiful and thriving, and the other one's a shithole, and, and fucking missionaries are getting kidnapped by exactly. gangs. Uh, to give it, to give it, to give an uh, uh, example, bro, this, this, I went to the Dominican Republic, and, and then we drove like um, three hours in country, and then we went to this um, small, super small city called Cabarete, Cabarete, and bro, actually, it's one is the top one best spot to, for 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 kite surfing, windsurf in the world, 
it's crazy. It's like, you know, like the, 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 the hotel is staying like 10 yards from the beach, right? And you don't have to leave the hotel or that little beach area to do anything. It's just amazing. It's like paradise for real, you know, like, and, and like Greg was saying, it's like, bro, you cross the, 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 the border, you have a war zone. Right. So it's, do they do, I mean, their border must be pretty secure then to keep all that bullshit out. Or is it just that on one side, it's so lawless that those people thrive well, there. So well, they just what do I thing? know about, about Haiti, it's because I'm Brazilian. So Brazil has this, this Brazil has military in Haiti helping, you know, like the, the well, whole when situation. I was even like part of the UN and stuff, there was, there were Brazilian exactly. guys. Yeah. Like, that's how I, how I know about Haiti, you know, like I've never been there and don't know people from there. So Greg, Greg have yeah. lived there. The UN peacekeeping force when I was there was Brazilian, and uh, there were some Chilean uh, peacekeepers there. Yep. yep. Um, all all UN peacekeepers, but dude, they were like you'd hear them getting down in gunfights in like City Soleil and stuff in Port-au-Prince, like daily. You'd hear them getting down in gunfights. Yeah. So I, yeah, Haiti is a total shithole, lawless, corrupt, and just run down and ragged. And then you go across, you literally like walk across a football field and you're in paradise. It's fucking bizarre, dude. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's talk about our weekend. We just wrapped up guns and geese camp three. Zero, fucking zero, rad. Three. We got, we got shifter for hanging out here with us. Hell yeah. He was, he was with us all weekend as well. I wish we had a fourth mic. I uh, know. Right. <laughs> Luke dropping the ball. Dang Luke. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was, uh. You know, my wife asked me, and she goes, it, was it the best camp yet? And I said, I, can, I don't even think that I can say one's better than the other because every single weekend that we've done this has been a fucking rad experience. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, like, we can say this was the best camp yet from, like, an logistics. operational yeah, logistic yeah. viewpoint. Obviously, the more we do them, the better... We're going to get at running them and we learn about little inefficiencies or things to do better. But for, as far as like the experience and the product, I can't say one's been better than the other because they've all been, in my opinion, they've all been about, I, I, can I don't tell, know what else we can offer. I can tell on my end, I think is the, is the, is the one week and I got the most tired, right? And yeah. not because we did more or less this and that, but I think it's the one that I have more experience with what we are doing, right? I have more, I'm more intimate with our our uh, foreman, yeah. right? So probably is the one I gave more energy, right? Put my 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 brain to work, you know. And at the end of the day, I felt really tired. Last night I was like done, bro. I was we all exhausted. were beat. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you think about it, you know. I mean, we're running just work camp wise. We're running like. 10 hour days and then with the after stuff which is part of the camping the experience the dinners the talks the bonfires we're running 14 15 hour days every day and, and, and it's crazy because like after like when you were hanging out at night with the with the with the with the students yeah. right they would stay for no, they'll stay all they'll, they'll, they'll stay till the sun hour, comes you know? up <laughs> if we stayed talking you know <laughs> no and, and so for people that aren't familiar with it the three of us came up with the idea to run a tactical pistol pistol course, Pistic, pistol. Pistical, tactical it's a, it's pistol, word. <laughs> <laughs> tactical pistol course, and basically introduction to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu all together over the course of three days. And uh, you know, as an idea, we were kicking around what a year ago, and then I mean, it's really lapping that fucking was like, you know what? We talked about this. We're fucking doing it, and <laughs> like Camp happen. One. Because I remember we talked about doing it, and then it was only maybe a month later or something. You're like, hey, these are the dates I'm thinking. and Here's the curriculum. Here's the here's curriculum. I got everything laid out. And it's like, like it. oh, we're really doing this. See, that's why I surround myself with people better myself. <laughs> and, then, and then shit just comes to fruition. But not only is it teaching people the like an introduction to pistol shooting and jiu-jitsu, but the 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 course has kind of grown into a, a, a thing of its own of where 20 to 30 people that are like-minded because if you're going to do a course like this chances are they're of a, a similar mindset and so you get 20 to 30 people that have similar goals similar mindset that hang out for three days and they go to all the training but then we're also eating dinner at night we had a, a big bonfire each event and just sit down and we talk with each other and it becomes like cathartic 
people are building friendships. People are starting to think about, man, how can I become better? What do I need to do to change the trajectory of my life? And this isn't even us like tooting our own horn. It's kind of like just the overall experience of everybody that's involved, both cadre and students. By the end of the third day, when people are leaving, they have a new fire inside of them. And we, I think that that goes for us as well. You know, like oh, 100%. there's a reason like, you know, Chris and, and Joel and Dave, like, yeah, they want to come and, and, and experience it. They're not out here for the tens of dollars we're paying them to. You know, <laughs> here's your check for $12.57. But, you know, like, it's cathartic for all of us. And the cool thing is, is, like, we see that fire in people when they walk out of the doors on the last day. But the proof in the pudding is we've had, what have we had now, 10 repeat customers? Yep. Something like that? Yeah, Maybe more? I mean, at least... I think we had 10 to 15 repeat customers yeah. in a course that's only 20 to 30 people. So this class, 25% of the students were repeat customers. Yeah. And when they walk through the door, I mean, what do we do? A couple months in between camps? Yeah. Two or uh, three, four months in between camps. When they walk through the door, they're different people. That bro, they're much better people. Much better people. It's they look healthier. See. Like you, it's almost like you can see an aura around them uh, of a higher level of positivity. And it's, I mean, <laughs> Mike, I didn't even recognize him. Dude, the first thing he walked in, I was like, holy shit, man, look at you. He's like, what? You know how humble he is? Yeah. Right? I'm like, dude, you look like, I mean, man, you look fucking good, dude. Like, look at you, bro. He looked like, younger. He looked, he looked happier. Younger, bro, he uh, looked happier. Props for, for Ron. Same bro, thing with Ron, too. Yeah. Like, bro, my, my dude Ron, like, bro, looks at 20 years younger, yeah. right? Looks like in better shape. And that's, that's the thing that... At the end of the day, is what you what you want to do for them, right? But it's funny because it's not like they do the course, and they and then they don't do anything else, and they come back better. I think they come here and they see they don't feel capable. I think they feel incapable, and then they. But the feeling is that after the course, they know they have to do something, right? They have to find a school, they have to practice, they have to do other courses, right? For for tactical courses find a school and train and that's when they win right so when they come back here we don't we plant the seed right we don't we don't we make light them the better we light the fire they keep it exactly going. we show them how much more they have to improve and they do that on themselves you know we are just we are just those guys that tap them there on the back and say bro go you know and they go you know and they when they come back they want to show the improvement and it's clear, bro. And and that's the thing where it makes everything worth, you know, like that's the thing's the goal. I right? think as this continues to grow and develop, that is going to be what brings people in. Yep. And, you know, we say on day one when people show up, three days of shooting in jiu-jitsu, not going to make you much better at shooting or jiu-jitsu. And, I mean, I say that kind of, uh, you're not going to become a badass at those things. But people do dram dramatically improve over those three days yeah you'll gain knowledge of but your actual skill set you know you're not going to like not know how to shoot a gun and be freaking a badass after three mornings on the range but but man just knowledge. even even like the last walk back drill the difference between and i'm not just saying this because i perform better on the last <laughs> one <laughs> no but like did you see how many more people seem to be performing better than they did the day before sorry chris <laughs> <laughs> no it's cool to see and then all the girls i mean this is this is a thing now the females bro they're killing it seem dude. to consistently outshoot the males at the end of the course yeah. and it's crazy how emotional everybody gets at the end right like every, nobody want to leave yeah right? i think uh, my, my, mike was posing this this morning like bro i wish i was on the range, the morning, getting to ready for the range again, you know. Well, again, and, you know, I think we we you know we ignite that that tribe mentality in in all of them, you know. And I think that's kind of what we're, I said that this weekend, and I never really thought of it this way, but that's I think what really sets this profile apart from other courses. You can go take look. You can go to other courses and learn how to shoot from badasses. You can go to other courses and learn how to grapple from badasses. But it, when the training is over, the course is over, right? Everyone goes back to their hotel room or whatever. The instructors go off on their own. Like here, we're kind of living as like a tribe together for those three days. 
and we get to know each other. They get to know us as instruct as they get to know us as people, not as the instructor in front of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, giving the commands or the instructions or the or whatever, you know, like they get to know like kind of the intimate side of us a little bit as well. And like that's something like most of them would probably never have access to, you know? Um yep. Yep. And also, and that's what I, I think I think also the, the this effect that causing people doesn't cause just on the students, right? I talk about for me, bro. At the end of the course, like because on the beginning of the course, I want to do as good as I do back in electric jiu-jitsu, right? My own gym. And at the end of the course, I want to do as good as I do here and back bring in the back gym. this <laughs> vibe to, to to electric jiu-jitsu, where yeah, I want to sure. be a better instructor, I want to be a better fighter, I want to be a better leader, right? And and bring this vibe, right? When the when the camp is over, bro. I right now I'm missing my 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 family, my crew, my my electric jujitsu. Right? I can't wait. I love being here, but I can't wait to go back there and bring this vibe, this vibe we create here to my to my to my place, right? And improve because I know that everybody gonna gonna love the the, the vibe, gonna love the feeling to being there and coming back. So. You know, I think this 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 reflects a lot on us, right? So it's not just like, oh, you're doing a good job. No, bro, you're doing an amazing job. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling I'm feeling pumped, right? I wanna I wanna be better. I wanna come back and and use the things I saw here, right? Because being around you guys, like your guys are great leaders, right? And I learn a lot. You know, you you guys have no idea how much I absorb this from you guys, right? And um, it, it makes me wanna be better. You know, as much as the students feel that, it, it reflects on me too, you know? And uh, fuck, bro, I fucking love this this, uh, this camp, you know? I think what you just said is like what a lot of people are missing because you've surrounded yourself with a group of people. Like you just said, you get energy, you get positivity, you get motivation from us, right? And it certainly goes all three ways, right? Exactly. And <clears throat> I get people that listen to the show that write me emails or hit me up on Instagram. Because one thing that I talk about a lot, just in relation to the weird times that we're in, is that you have to have a good group of people. That's the most important thing if we are to face any type of hard times as a society or any of the shit that we talk about, the grid going down or government unrest, the very first thing that you need to have to be successful is have good people around you. And I talk about it a lot. And I get emails that are like, man, like I listen to what you're saying and I, and I agree with you, but I don't have any good people in my life. I don't have any good friends in my life. And so to me, that's weird. Cause I feel like I've maintained close friendships with people that I feel are important for a long time. Like you and I have been homies for a decade already now, oh, yeah. you know, but a lot of people are missing that. And to people that have a good core group of people that may seem kind of strange or something that I can't necessarily relate to. But I think a lot of people don't have that and so some of the people that come down here when they go home they probably don't have the right tribe around them no for sure not. and that is so that is what's the most eye-opening part of this experience is like oh when i'm in a room with 30 people with the same energy and trying to better themselves and trying to become more healthy both like spiritually and physically when they go home now they know like that shit's not going to come to you you have to seek it yep. shit like that has to be sought out and so one thing that we always tell the students is when you go home, find a jujitsu academy. And bro, it's like you said, nobody ever said karate changed my life. There's not sure. I never saw a shirt say yeah, that. <laughs> you know, but everybody that trains jujitsu will say jujitsu changed my life. And it has nothing to do with choking each other. It has to do with finding a good group of people that like to choke each other, choke each other, <laughs> but build each other up and be there for each other and make each other better. And all that shit's important. And I think after three days in an academy that is really showing that front and center, people leave here and they're like, okay, I felt that. I know what it's like to feel like, to feel that energy. Now I have to go find that. They have a good standard to start yeah. off. Oh, the biggest thing too is they've spent three days with strangers struggling together. Mm -hmm. Look at some of the faces when they're on the mat or even on the range, you know, day the day three, when we did the collar tie contact shooting drill, and as soon as I explained what we were doing and then went up to the target and demoed it dry, I could see faces in the crowd. 
male and female alike, civilians and cops alike. You saw their face. I could see half the class at least got fucking scared. I get it. It's new. And, you know, like I was like, you're going to feel the muzzle blast. You might get a little powder burn on your face, you know, like, and it's okay. And same thing on the mats. You got all these strangers sweating and tired and physically exhausted and scared of getting thrown over some stranger's shoulder for the first time it ever and crazy, falling dude. on the so mat. Finish. Right, finish. And they're fucking uncomfortable together and struggling together. And the only thing that changes things is what? Time and pressure. Well, they don't have the time, right? It's only three days, but they get the pressure. They get the nerves, and then they overcome that together. I, I like that's to see what the builds bonds. I like you know? to see the difference between the, the day zero, right? The day before we do the in brief at night, before we start, and how we break the ice on that day one, right? And at the end of the day one, when you when when you, when you're here at the gym, uh, eating together, it's totally different vibes, totally different people already, right? And they chew around the fire camps, bro. It's different people again and they treat everybody's emotional about leaving yeah. right? and kind of and I, and and you guys can see because they come to us and shake our hands and most of them don't even have words right to express what they feel right they just shake your hand and give you that one hug right and and that that that's that's crazy bro that's uh that's meaningful for me you know of yeah and what's what's cool is like most of the people that have attended our camps and like that attended this one are not already jujitsu people. Mm -hmm. Or if they come to us, they like just started. Like a bunch of the white belts like just started training jujitsu at their home kind of because they signed up for this. Like, damn, I need to learn a little something. Most of them are not jujitsu. So that day one, that first day of of jujitsu and being on the range together mm -hmm. has has brought them that much closer overnight. You know, it's not like yeah, they're yeah. jujitsu guys, so yeah. they all can bond with jujitsu. Hey, I'm a purple belt. Hey, I'm a brown belt. Cool. Let's talk. What's your favorite position? Are you uh -huh. top player? But you know, like, and they're brand new. Bad. They're brand new. And one day of jujitsu, one day of shooting on the range together, like boom. Okay, now we're now we're cool. We're friends. Well, we've kind of lost touch with what being new to jujitsu feels like. But talking to some of the students, I think it was Derek Kiwi. It was like, yeah, like crawling on top of a girl. And like mounting a small female, there's some, and I'm not sure if it was Derek or not. So if I have it wrong, I apologize. But it's like, there's some reservations about that. It feels kind of weird, right? Because at what point in your life can you literally lay on top of another female and be sweating on each other and it's completely normal, right? So people that haven't experienced that, that intimate connection and that, that literally just being, most people have a bubble around them, right? Just like the guy that grabbed your backpack, right? If you get in people's bubble, that's a fucking problem. But in jujitsu, you're allowing people into that bubble willingly, and it's very uncomfortable at first for a lot of people, regardless of whether or not they admit it or talk about it. And you break down that physical barrier, and then I feel like the emotional barrier is broken down simultaneously, you know? Exactly. I agree. 100%. What else about the cap? I know, I know you're angry today, but you got good stuff to talk about, right? About the camp? Yeah, I mean, the camp's good for all of us, you know? Um, I, I, I miss this when you guys get on the bird tonight, you know? Like, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and it's going to be back to normal life, and I live a great fucking normal life. But I'm like, for me, personally, like, I've got my buddies here. I'm real fortunate. Yeah. You know, like, I've got guys like Chris here, and I've got guys like Dave and Joel and we all have our own families, and we all kind of separate. But like, I get to see him almost every day. Mm -hmm. You guys have your team. You got you have your our team. Drives right. You know, but for me, it's like, I don't know. We're not uh, living together, if that makes sense. Like I told you during Ida, during Hurricane Ida, like that mm -hmm. was some of the happiest I'd ever been. Because you get up in the morning, you have a purpose, you have a job that has to get accomplished. Otherwise, you don't eat that night, or you you know, like your generators die, or all that stuff. Um, you got to clean up the clean up the street, or else you can't get your car out. You got to go, you know, get your chainsaw. And we worked together as a community, and we supported and took care of each other. And like this weekend for me, like getting together 
and hey, all right, range is over. We all clean up the range together. We all go to lunch together and hang out. We all bullshit over like that to me is also like as as men, I think that's super important for us Definitely. because we don't get a lot of that uh, male bonding time as adults once we have families and shit. And for me, that's kind of like the most important part of this. You know, I like teaching on the range. It's fun, but that's like the job part of it. I love hanging out, having lunch and bonding. I love the after hour stuff where we're having dinner and we're sharing thoughts, feelings, stories, motivation, motivating people. Like that's the cathartic part that I think for me is the most important. You know, people can go anywhere to learn shooting. People can go anywhere to learn jujitsu, but they can't go places and then get all the other benefits of, you know, whether I don't want to call it motivational speaking and warrior mindset and blah, blah, blah. But that's kind of what it is. You know, we yeah. are it's motivated organic, to. It's yeah. organic. Yeah, yeah. It's not like. All right, you, sit down, find your nameplate. Yeah, you, we're you talk, can you attend know? a seminar on leadership or you can go listen to a retired seal talk about that kind of stuff at a standing at a podium but when you're all sitting together it's not like we're telling them how to live or giving them suggestions it's more like showing them and i think i mean and i don't know if artem listens to the podcast or not but i'm gonna make a prediction he's gonna be the one that comes back a different person he better he better. <laughs> no, if, if Arden if Arden doesn't Arden. come in and start training, and I hope you he better. listens to this, <laughs> if he doesn't come in and start training, every time I see him driving around town it's in his new GX470 <laughs> that he just bought, gonna, I'm going to give him so much shit. <laughs> no, but he's a perfect example. And, uh, I mean, I, I feel comfortable talking about it because he shared it with the whole group. It's like he used to be an elite athlete, and then life happens like it does to so many people, you know? And... Uh, at least for me, when I feel like I'm not as good as I used to be, that bothers me. Hell yeah. Definitely. And I know at some point, Father Time is going to take that away from you, and it is what it is. But I think by that point, we'll probably be on a different journey, you know? But if, you, if you've if you let the just the daily grind and the stresses of life start to detract from who you are as a human being and a man, you might not even realize it. It just sneaks up on you. And then here you are 10 years later, and fucking you're not as proud of who you are anymore. And then that's just a downward spiral, you know? And it was cool because Austin Ray came out and joined the camp. And if you guys don't know who he is, check out his Instagram, but he's an acrobat that does parkour and a bunch of crazy flips and stuff. Freaking elite athlete. Yeah. Oh he's God. a fucking rad dude. <laughs> Dude's a fucking monster. But when he walked in, Arden's like, dude, what's up, man? Come to find out they were gymnasts together. Arden was his coach. What? 15 years ago or something like that. Yeah, probably 15, 16 years ago. You know? Arden was his coach. And so then after after we're doing jiu-jitsu, Austin's teaching us three how to do backflips. And Arden walks out there and goes, I want to try one. He goes, it's been forever, but I want to try been one. In a decade, he said. And he fucking did it, dude. Bro, he did one test jump with with Austin spotting him. I and, think we're all joking. Then we, and he fucking did it right. And we're like, whoa. And bro, I think that backflip, is symbolic fuck yeah it is for bringing out who he used to be well that athleticism and then just the balls to fucking send it yeah you know like like fuck wait a second i'm not this guy that i've gotten broken down into i'm a fucking badass still you know like and i told him you know and you know like i'm you guys are a lot like me like here this place this family jujitsu like i'm brutally honest with all my students and I may upset you with something I say, you know, sometimes it's not the most couth or I'm not, I don't, but like I do that cause I care. I'm growing into that. If I'm not honest with you, if I don't say shit to you, that's when you have to worry. Cause yeah. it means I don't give a fuck about you. You know, if I'm like, right. you know, once I get, and I was like, dude, like I could see it in him and I can see he needs it. And you know, I'm like, dude, you inside that what's, what's taken over the last 10 years, there's a fucking elite athlete. Ready to come back out. Yeah. Let's get you there. Let's do it. I told him, I said, I want you to be the next alumni that signs up for a future class. And when you walk through that door, I don't want to fucking recognize you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? And he goes, I'm down, dude. I'm down. Well, he's going to be my student. He better. So. Yeah, dude, the, having hard conversations with people. Like, I feel like I've always been able to do that with people that are close to me or like people that are my families. 
but like students in my gym, like I don't want, I've kind of avoided, I would say avoid confrontation with people that are just students of mine, unless it's just absolutely egregious and it's right. like, get the fuck off my mats. You know, if some, and that stuff like that's rarely, rarely happens, but just trying to like give people brutal honesty. Cause I know it's going to hurt their feelings. Right. And uh, I'm not even gonna say his name, but I had a student that had some, just some drama in his life and some, some legal problems and bouncing around and all a lot of drama in his personal life. Right. And then he bounced from the gym for like six months or a year and then he showed up one day. He's like, I'm ready to train again. And he used to bring that drama, all of his fucking drama. So I sat him down. I said, listen, your jiu-jitsu is great, and I think you're a good person. But all your fucking bullshit, the, that fucking dark cloud that surrounds you, getting arrested and fucking getting in fights with people and all that bullshit will not come in my fucking gym one more time. Just so we're clear. And, uh, dude, he sent me a text after our talk. He's like, that's the conversation I needed. I'm looking, at, I look to you like a father figure. I need guidance from you. If you think I'm fucking up, like, please have those hard talks with me because nobody else has those kind of conversations with me. That's happened a couple times with different people. I would say over the last six months and it makes you realize it's like, I don't, I don't like to look at myself as a leader necessarily. Cause I think leadership is fluid, right? Like, I'm happy to follow your lead in the right circumstance, just like you would be happy to follow my lead if the right circumstances present itself. But the fact of the matter is, in your jiu-jitsu academy, you are the leader of the academy. And people are looking to you for a lot more guidance and than just, just jiu-jitsu. Instruction. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still, I still don't believe that half the time. You know, I, I really don't because, like, these are my peers. Yeah. You know, and, and I don't. I, I gaff off how much sometimes certain people in here are like, oh, he's coach. Oh, I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm just Greg. But they want those talks, and you know, you, you got to do it. And I kind of do it sometimes. A lot of times, like day to day, Matt stuff. Like if it's just annoying stuff, like I do it kind of passive aggressively. Like one guy talks all the time, all the time, middle of sparring. I'm like, dude, do you talk this much when you're having sex? <laughs> <laughs> just roll. Like, come on, man. You know, <laughs> like. Yeah, bro. Let's. T- well, I don't think we've talked about this on the show, so let's go down this rabbit hole. When you were fucking sparring another human being, it is not the time to talk about what you did over the last weekend. Mm, that fucking nope. drives me. Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck <laughs> up and go. And not only like is it just, it kills the energy, right? But like, it's detracting from your fucking training partner mm-hmm. because. There's a 90% chance, probably 99% chance that whoever you're rolling with and talking to, they don't really want to fucking talk. They want to train, you know? And I, I tell my students that. I say, class is over at 7.30. I'm usually not locking the doors until 8.30. Right. It takes an hour to clean the gym. But that hour isn't cleaning the gym. That it's hour is out, everybody talking. sitting around talking, right? And I think... That's one of the most important hours of the night. I'm not saying that that's not necessary, but that's where you can fucking bond with your teammates. And if that's not enough, go get a fucking beer afterwards. Right. When it, the bell goes ding, yeah, it's time to pull hard. Yeah, and it's like, and kids like kids are worse at that, but they're kids, so they get a pass. Get I mean, I still jump a on a little them. bit of a pass. No, no, I jump on them. Yeah. Like no talking when you're sparring. Period. Yeah. You know, but when adults do it, it's like the fuck are you doing dude you know but they are there also to learn that right they, they didn't know before you say anything yeah, yeah. you got to teach medicate and like i tell them all the time like i'll have you know like i'll have you know a blue belt or purple belt coming to me and man so and so new keeps gripping my skin through my gi or grab grab my finger today i'm like bro tell them tell them to stop that's our job right my job is to tell my blue belts and purple belts not to footlock my brand new white belts. Your job is to tell, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, he, I had that talk recently. Heel hooking them in Bro, a gi. <laughs> I had that talk. I look over and, yeah, I look over and some new guy's like trying to heel hook in a gi. I'm like, whoa, whoa, stop. Like, and I have to have that talk. Hey, everybody, every class, I line them up on the wall. Here's the deal blue belts, don't footlock brand new white belts. White belts, don't be footlocking anybody. If you're trying to learn a new footlock that we taught in, in class, Right, you can drill it then. If you're with a higher level belt that's allowed to do certain footlocks, then you want to practice it, and they're okay with it, you know. Bro, I'm totally against footlocking girls, no matter what. 
Yeah. yeah though the foot lock grows. They're they're different, right? Like, yeah. And I see sometimes this purple belt foot locking blue belt girls, like, and I'm like, dude, why are you doing that? Oh, what is jujitsu? I'm like, yeah, but yeah. it's different, you know. Like, you could be more, you could be more technical too, and yeah, that's jujitsu, sure. you know. You I could mean, go after position other than crank a foot lock on a girl that have to go work afterwards or tomorrow, right? And you might break something there. Bro, I don't even, right. I don't even. When I roll with girls, I don't even submit them. Yeah, it's flow. You know, right? I'm, I'm kind of like flowing. You know, like I choke out Rachel Anderson sometimes. No, but that's totally fine. <laughs> Shout yeah. out Rachel Anderson, yeah, but, she de- <laughs> but she deserves it. That's totally fine. <laughs> Have you started my ab routine yet? My, my six minute ab routine. <laughs> no, foot locks are a weird thing, man. Because like, I don't foot lock dudes. Honestly, bro. If I they're foot, not black belts foot, or yeah. brown belts, I don't. I just don't. And you're yeah. one of the best foot lockers there is. That's the point. Yeah, you, know? like, you foot locked the shit out of Jeff Munson, didn't you? But hey. there's no girl. <laughs> <laughs> I I will I will foot lock dudes. I I will. I've been playing with the Estima a lot. And I'll Estima lock the fuck. Hey, out will of you someone. foot lock the other Greg? And I'll I'll toe hold the fuck out of people too, especially when they go. You're gonna have to fucking break it, <laughs> <laughs> and then I hear his foot start to tear and rip under hey, my ear. Hey, let go I real feel quick. Like foot locks are like ha, ha, it, it's a switch on me, you know. Like when you try to foot lock hey, me, you 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 you're, you're fucked. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bro, I was so mad. You wanna try? <laughs> bro, I was, uh, let me. Let me try taking my arm. Hold on, me, a second, choke. This is it's a good. Fine. This is a good. But bro, story. you try fucking foot lock me. You're fucking fucked. Let bro. me unpack. <laughs> let me unpack Greg Lapp and foot locking me though, okay? <laughs> because. We were starting in position where one guy's doing guard and one guy's up. Yeah, we were positional st- positional starting open guard. Okay. Snatches this fucking foot lock up. Yeah, we I was trying to pass and then the foot was there, so I went for the And total. so I was fu- I was instantly pissed off. And I was like, dude, if you want to fucking foot lock me, you gotta take me down and get on top of me. You know, like <laughs> like you gotta earn it. If I pull guard, foot lock the fuck out of me. But I started in guard, dude. And like, I'm hard to take hey, close down. Close your guard, sweet right. bean. Fuck it, <laughs> fucking earn it. You're black so, I, so I was like, <laughs> cover, your, cover your own ass. Oh, yeah. So, so I was like, he'll fu- fuck. I don't care. Fucking break it. Dude. He literally said that, dude. And I, I like, I grabbed it, and I didn't want to go. You know, I'm hey, like, fucking break it. And I was gonna let him too. And it started fucking popping, and he let go. So I won. <laughs> <laughs> he got up and he limped over to the wall and goes. Ah, oh, my fucking foot kind of hurts, bro. <laughs> bro, and then it felt fine for the rest of the day. Yeah. And then, like, a couple, like, either the next day or a couple of days afterwards, it felt kind of fucked up. And I was like, because you never know, like, when you twist a knee or an ankle in jiu-jitsu, it's like, is this going to hurt for 48 hours or is it going to hurt for four months? Sometimes. to hospital. Yeah. Like, yeah. right. You Straight don't... to the surgery table. And so I was like, God damn it, dude. I, I fucked myself up with ego because I could have just tapped out. And I was like, nope, I'm going to make this motherfucker. Br- making one of my best friends break my foot if but he you, wants to get a tap But on you me. still won. And I don't want to <laughs> tap that bad, bro. I could give a fuck less whether I tap you or not. As soon as I, and like when I started to tuck it in, right, my head was close too. And I, I what I heard, I started to oh, hear was that like. Esteema lock? Yeah. Fuck uh, toe the, hold. Fuck toe hold. But you started it with the esteema lock. I don't remember. You snatched it up like however that is. And then you started bending the toes. Maybe. And it's like. No, uh, no, no, no! It wasn't his, like foot. his foot was here. I went, I went this way. I turned out told, and then because I rolled under, right when he's like, "You break it," I started rolling, but I didn't dive. You know, like I sat down. I was, and I put it in tight, and he's like, "You're gonna have to break it." And I'm like, "Well, let me just see if you know, like, let's see, you know." And then I heard just some a little like, you know, it was like, "Fuck, bro, <laughs> come on, man." <laughs> I was like, "Fine, you win, bro. I don't want the tap that bad. I could care less. I'm not gonna hurt one of my buddies." You know, dude, <laughs> my tournament bad. competition, my, bro. My bad. I'd grab and wow, dive on. I'd be break your ankle, break your foot. Yes, yeah, hey. you know, it's a competition. Bro. I've been there, bro. You dude. didn't break my foot, jujitsu. That's bro. right. That's there, what I said. Bro. And right away, he goes, "Ah, man, my foot." I said, "I didn't hurt your foot. You hurt your foot." <laughs> <laughs> I pulled a, a bro, Joel that, proverb a point, on him, but that's the point, bro. You know, like the guy gets you in the submission. You don't tap, it breaks, it's your fault. Yeah, yeah for 100%, sure. 100%, absolutely. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. But you I don't have know. the power to stop so, that thing right away. So know? what do you think that it is? Because I have zero problems tapping to an armbar, a Kimura, Americana, or even a choke. But foot locks, I'm like, fuck you, I'm not tapping to this. <laughs> you know, I need to start doing your weird Man, foot stretch. I, I, I feel this way, bro. I don't want to break. I have to work tomorrow, right? Yeah. But if I have to tap, I tap. 
when I come after you, you know, like yeah, yeah, again when we when we slap them up <laughs> because, again bah. because I'm a competitor, you know. Yeah, I, I I see numbers, you know, I see zeros and ones, yeah. you know, and everything, <laughs> you know, like matrix, the, the the black screen, but you know, bro, and I mean, you can tap me. But uh, if you tap me once and I tap you twice, I won't. Yeah, you know? oh, yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> that's yeah, totally fine. Yeah, and yeah, I forget yeah, for about sure. that. You know. But if I tap, if I tap you once, you tap me twice, bro. Tomorrow you're gonna have yeah, a hard time. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna have a hard row. You yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I got some students that like when you submit them, and you go, get back to your feet and you slap and bump. They're coming at you 150 percent now. Just like you said, they want to try and redeem themselves. You know, and it's like with certain guys. I'll fucking play that into when I submit them, watch the clock or whatever, holding the Kimura, and there's 40 seconds left. Like, I could rip it, and then we could... Just let them cook We could get 35 first. more seconds of grappling, right? Okay, I'll hold it. Okay, five seconds left. Bang. Hmm. Ding. Oh, fuck, dude. <laughs> take, no time to yeah, pay back. <laughs> take, take away their Go chance home. for fucking retribution. <laughs> I'll leave you there. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. You guys see uh, the uh, governor of Florida is paying five thousand dollars sign on bonus for law enforcement for cops that are getting fired from other states. Yeah, did you see that? No, bro. He did a press conference yesterday, awesome. and he goes, "Hey, Florida loves good cops, and we want good cops. And if your state doesn't want you, Florida does want you." Also, Florida is better than many other states, right? Dude, I mean, bro, they're bullshit. coming up and up and up, man. Dude, Florida's fucking Ron DeSantis. But it, it, like, like me and Lappin were talking earlier, it's kind of strange that like one man sitting at the top of the throne can fucking dictate so much shit that's happening in people's lives. Bro, Haiti and Dominican Republic, it's like the same fucking thing. Yeah. You got one good governor and the state's flourishing. Right, and you have a tire on the other side of the wall. And look, I mean, we're in Louisiana. We're like just right, just around the Gulf a little bit, you know, just two states away. Your governor's basically. a piece of shit, right? And our governor's some fucking pandering Democrat, you know. That's you're gonna he's gonna fall, he's gonna toe the party line, and we still got kids in school wearing masks all fucking day, you know. I think our governor in Washington might be the worst. No, he's the second worst. Gavin Newsom's the Dude, fucking worst. Gavin Newsom and your, the, I mean, they're both pretty fucking they're bad. They're fucking cucks. That's my favorite word to describe them. Fucking cucks. Because that's what that motherfucker is, fucking right? shit whistle. But dude, one fucking guy can just <laughs> arbitrarily decide this is what you need to do. And dude, like Washington State's losing police officers by the fucking heaps of them, dude. And it's it's crazy that that's where we're at. And and it feels like every officer that you lose in this circumstance, basically you are losing the best cops, right? Hundred percent. Yeah. You're losing the ones that are stand that stand by their principles and morals, which are the guys that don't get corrupted and dirty, right? And don't violate the law because exactly. they have principles and morals. The the ones that be like, ah, I'll do, it, I'll do it. Okay. Well, what else are you gonna do? You know. Like, yeah, yeah. And not even like. Not even necessarily like a cop that's going to be corrupt, but just one that's a yes man. Just uh, does what does what I'm told, doesn't buck the system, doesn't question anybody. Just, okay, you told me to do this. Yeah, okay, I'll go do that. You And, and like, it's, it's weird what, reading these threads on Instagram because I've been saying the same thing about the military, right? Because they're doing that. Like, it, like they're losing fucking pilots and special operations guys because they don't want to take the vaccine. And you'll get people defending these people in threads are like, when you sign the dotted line to join the military, you're basically government property. So that is what it is. I'm like, no, that's actually, nothing could be further from the truth. You were taught as a fucking private in the military that you have the right, not only the right, but the obligation to refuse orders that you think are immoral, unethical, or illegal, right? So if you're perceiving what they're doing to you as immoral and unethical, you're fucking duty bound to say, no, no, no. We don't have to fucking do this. This isn't the fucking Chinese army. You know what I mean? Those are the ones that are going to throw people in jail for walking on the streets without committing any crimes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, no. like, you know, like the opposite of what you did, right? Back in yeah. a year ago, right? No, and it's, uh, I mean, fuck, dude. It's, you look at the countries that are already doing that stuff and you have to ask, like, man, is that where we're headed? But then again, I have a fucking... All three of us have kind of a skewed percep perception of this because we live in fucking Democrat cesspool states, right? There's a, 
I was talking to Ivan, Ivan Salivary the other day. I went and had dinner with him and he's like, man, I talked to one of my buddies in Florida and he goes, you're still, you're still talking about COVID. That, like, that's really a thing up there. Like, that's how far removed, like for certain parts of this country, the fucking pandemic is over. Yeah. It's over. As, as it fucking should be. And then for other parts of the country, like the, I don't have any sources that can confirm this, but supposedly Washington state. This is through the rumor mill of people I know that work for different school districts. The rumor mill says Washington state children will have to be fully vaccinated to go back to school uh, September or the fall of 2022. I told you. I mean, we talked about you and I talked about that's that's happening. That's going to happen. I you know, know it just that's I know that's going to happen. You know, like I, I sent you that thing the other day. Uh, a note got sent home with one of my buddy's daughters in, in middle school, I think like fourth grade. Oh, with vaccination requirements, right? Yeah, yeah. And she she was past due on like a well check, and some like long time vaccination that's been around for you know hundreds of years, decades or whatever, and like, and then yeah, already thousands on of it, years, thousands. Bro, you know, I, I got to my limit bro. already. My, it's posted daughter, on there. COVID nineteen. I, I went to the point where you, my daughter, using masks during school is the is the is the most I can get. That's it. Vaccination. She's not taking vaccines. Or I'll fucking kill you. Fuck no. I'll fucking you know? kill you if you think you're going to exactly. put that shit in my kids. Exactly, bro. You know? You know, like, I go to the mask, you know, but put something, that's something outside, right? But put something inside, no way, bro. Yeah. And then she's out of school, and they're going to find a, a different, oh, uh, Like a co-op or something. Exactly. Yeah, and I had some fucking idiot. I, I, I get a lot of idiots writing me stuff. Dude, uh, this because the majority of people are fucking And idiots. he goes, I want to know, and I don't even respond to him because I'm not going to fucking reply to you with what vaccinations my daughters have received. He goes, I want to know what vaccinations you, you did give your daughter, and now why this one's such a big fucking problem. And it's like, our doctor, our pediatrician, will not vaccinate our children. And here's the thing. This is all new to me, too. Like, I didn't realize how dirty big pharma and the vaccination industry is. And it's fucking dirty once you start to look into it. But, uh, like, luckily, we had a pediatrician that goes, <clears throat> I don't believe. And he's, like, 70, right? So he's going off of his morals. He doesn't give a fuck at this point in his life what he's being told to do or who's telling him what how he should run his practice. He goes, I'm not putting anything in your daughters that doesn't have at least 30 years of research behind it. And he goes, so anything that they want for for the school that is a requirement, well, I don't care. I don't think we need to. This is what I think we I'm comfortable with. And so we have a bunch of waivers. Our daughters are not up to Washington State standards, and they haven't been ever. And we just submit a waiver, and the doctor would sign off on it. No problem, right? And so they still... People say like, oh no, the school districts have always had a fucking vaccination requirement. They have one on paper. But if you talk to them and your doctor says, hey, we're not comfortable with this, it's never been a problem. My fucking daughters were in public school until a year ago. It was never a problem. But this one's a problem. You know? My, my, my biggest thing is like, people have lost sight of their actual duties, not their jobs. Right. And, and in particular, obviously, our politicians, but that goes for doctors, that goes for uh, educators and, and administration of education. You know, they're just doing their job rather than what their duty is. And like a good example right now, the the school mask mandate has been downgraded. They don't have to wear masks outside now. Right. So I was asking my son the other day, I was talking to my kids and I asked them, you know, hey, how today go? Did you have P.E. today? Yeah, we had PE. I said, oh, what'd you do? I'm talking to him. I said, oh, we did this and some exercise or whatever. And I was like, oh, cool. I said, did you have to wear a mask for that? He's like, yeah. I'm like, why the fuck are you wearing a mask? And I'm obviously not yelling at him, but I'm so mad. Why are you wearing a mask? Why are these kids wearing a mask while you're exercising? And he goes, well, we do PE in the, in the gymnasium. So at what point in time does the fucking educator or the principal or the vice principal of the school be like, hey, you know what? Kids have to wear masks inside, so we're going to go ahead and do PE outside every day. Yeah. Or how about this? <laughs> we're not going to have them wear masks inside. That's, I mean, that's you know the what I mean? best thing is like, like where's the Where's up? the fucking principals? Because behind closed doors, everybody fucking says exactly what we're saying, but nobody will fucking stand up. And dude, they won't stand up for the kids. They're not going to no. fucking stand up for Fuck anything, no. dude. Bro, I don't think they have research enough in data to guarantee that this vaccine is going to 
won't affect our grandchild, right? So that's the that's my point, bro. It's like, what do you know about it for the next 20 years, 30 years? They don't know shit about it now because you're vaccinating elders. You know, it's something, right? But for the kids, bro, you know, what what, what the cost on the on their future? Well, and right? dude, what's every, gonna change? What's everything gonna, you do, happen? everything you do in life has to be a risk versus reward, right? You have to weigh your pros and cons. And so, yeah, if you're a fucking person that's old and fat and it's going to fuck, COVID will kill you if you get it. Okay, well, we don't know much about the vaccine, but maybe in my circumstance, it'll help me. The kids don't fucking need it. We all know that, dude, you know? And like, bro, fucking Fauci is responsible for killing millions and millions of people. Dude, it's ridiculous. Nobody gives a fuck about it. But then, then the study came out of him fucking funding beagles being eaten alive by flies. Did you see that shit? Yep. People got a soft spot for dogs, And man. people are outraged by it. And here's the thing. I'm not downplaying that. No. I, I, we're all fucking dog people, right? And that motherfucker is just dirty. But I find it strange that there's outrage over the beagles when this motherfucker wants to pump your children full of some shit that we have no idea what it's going to do to them. Like, These that doesn't the outrage people, you? Right? It's the same people are complaining about the beagles, but they're putting whatever inside their children, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, dude. So it's like, what the fuck is going on, you know? Yep. People need to be held accountable. The fucking political elites are so far removed from, from uh, the rest of the population. Uh, they have zero idea of what our interests are. They have zero fucking idea of what we need or how to represent us. They're so fucking far removed. They have, what, a 450-something thousand dollar fence around their beach house now? Is yeah, Biden, yeah, Biden had a, a fence put up around his beach house and it cost the taxpayers $450,000. But here's the other thing, dude, is like you can't... I don't think, even if we had good people in positions of office, I don't think it's feasible or realistic to have... One president that's the leader of 350 million people. Like a leader is supposed to be a position that's like tribal. You know what I mean? Like I think people need to live in like smaller bands of people where if someone's going to ask you if some, to do something or tell you to do something, you should have a relationship with that person or you should at least know who that person is. Now we got, we got people on the other side of the country that have been in office longer than I've been alive telling you how to act, what to do, how much money you need to pay them. And it's, it's the whole system is a bunch of fucking bullshit. What video are you watching during the podcast? I was trying to save a video. I didn't know it was going to fucking start playing. That's because you, you're over here on your phone the whole time. Text messaging, and was, Instagram. I'm, I'm, I'm doing business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I'm right. Doing business. Sounds like business. <laughs> <laughs> But business. not every episode has to be three hours. I know we have a lot to do today, so... Shit, you guys got to go to the airport. We're like, already, Yeah, I mean, we're already an hour and 20 in. 50 minutes, you got to go to the airport. Um, we well, I just wanted cars. to do a, a recap on guns and geese and shoot the shit for a little bit, but is there anything else on your mind? Because we can wrap it up. We can have a short episode, and if Endless Endeavor listeners are upset with the, the length of this episode, let Greg Lappin know. Yeah. Go to his Instagram That's and, right. and complain in his inbox That's because right. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, I, I don't I don't either. It's not even my podcast. So. <laughs> yeah, but, if you want the co-host status. Yeah. Oh, uh, This wasn't as good as the Greg and Mitch show, but well, it's dude, as good as, you know. Here's the thing, you dude. You never the, know, bro. You never know, you know. Yeah. Partly is subjective. That's right? true. That's true. No, no, no. Here's the thing, man. There's, I think the reason that a lot of people like this podcast is because... The energy is just kind of, it's alive. And if, if I'm mad about something and I'm venting, yeah, Greg's mad. But like good conversations, passionate conversations, like whatever, man. Like instead of being a product that is like, I'm going to go tune into this so I feel this way. It's just more organic and authentic. And that's what fucking, I think like I look at Joe Rogan and Andy Stump, like those guys are doing fucking awesome in this industry. And I think it's because... That's kind of how they roll. That's organic. They just they just take people and they have conversations. Like when I have people on the show, we don't have any notes. I don't. I didn't write anything out. I don't have questions for Joe Joao Assis, world champion. Tell me what you think of you know like 
That's not what people want to hear, dude. So you never know what you're gonna get. The endless endeavor podcast is like a box of chocolates. Right? <laughs> you never know what you're gonna get. All but, right. Well, yeah, we do got to wrap it up because I didn't realize. Yeah. We gotta be at the airport before too long. Yeah, so yeah. I'm hungry, and I'm hungry. I'm hungry guys. too. I need to go well, eat. Did you it's fall time. me? I need to eat a bunch of steak, <laughs> eggs, and apples before yeah. I get on the flight.